Hebrews, and we start tonight into the third major section of the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, going through chapter 7, verse 28. Uh, It's the section, if you still have a copy of this uh, outline, it's the section that I've entitled, Hold Fast Your Confession of Christ Because His Priesthood is Superior to the Levitical Priesthood. Uh, So as we begin here in verse 5, we're entering into this section of discussion about Christ's office as high priest, and this is one of the major themes of the entire book. It's also one of the unique theological contributions of the book of Hebrews to our Christian theology. Uh, Other portions of the New Testament do uh, uh, mention or uh, talk about Christ's uh, high priesthood, but Uh, Only in the book of Hebrews is this office explained and uh, uh, supported and uh, demonstrated uh, clearly uh, in a a, uh, systematic fashion. Uh, So this is really the heart of what we're looking at in the book of Hebrews, Christ's high priestly office and ministry. Now we've already seen in earlier chapters Christ is superior to the Old Testament prophets He's superior to angels. We've seen that he is superior to Moses. And now we're moving into this section on the priesthood of Christ. We're going to see that that the author compares Christ with Aaron and that Christ is greater than Aaron as high priest. Uh, Just to uh, kind of continue providing a little bit of background uh, about this topic, Uh, Christ came into the office of prophet at his baptism. Uh, You remember the voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And during his earthly ministry, Christ uh, brought a new revelation, which is uh, what we saw in Hebrews uh, chapter 1 at the beginning. God has spoken to us in his son. So Christ uh, came to us as the prophet at his baptism. And it was at his resurrection and ascension to God's right hand in heaven, that he entered into the office of priest. Um, And so that is, uh, again, what we're looking at tonight. And then we're going to uh, uh, have to wait to understand that it's when Jesus returns, whenever that may be, that he will enter and assume the office of king. So these are the three uh, uh, official roles of Messiah Christ. He's prophet, priest, and king. All of those are roles and offices appointed to him by God. Uh, Christ's high priestly office is an essential doctrine for every Christian to understand. But the problem is, this is not an easy topic to master. When we begin to discuss Christ's priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, uh, people's eyes begin to glaze over, they begin to... Uh, a worry that they're not going to be able to understand, uh, you know, what is this, uh, uh, the, uh, the order of Melchizedek, and what does that have to do with Christ's priesthood? And when we talk about this, it sounds strange and, and mysterious. And then furthermore, because Christ, our high priest, is in heaven, this fact demands that we exercise faith to access the benefits of his ministry. It's not Uh, like when Christ was uh, present personally on this earth and his disciples could personally interact with him. Instead, we, uh, uh, we relate to God by faith through the priesthood of Christ in heaven. And for many Christians, this just seems like too much work, too much effort. Uh, They prefer to muddle through life without putting out too much spiritual effort to grow in their faith or to uh, grow in their knowledge of Christ's priestly ministry. But the problem is when life gets hard, when pressures mount, when trials come, that is the time when we need the high priesthood of Christ for us. You need to know Christ as your high priest. You need to know him well as your high priest. You need to understand his ministry on your behalf. And so tonight as we begin this section describing Christ's high priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, uh, 
uh, we see that it is because Christ is greater than Aaron that you must grow in your knowledge and understanding of Christ's high priesthood. So that's where we're going today. And if you're going to grow in knowing and understanding what Christ's priesthood is and what it means, tonight we're going to present to you two basic and fundamental truths that will help you to begin to grasp and understand the significance of this doctrine. And this is a doctrinal topic. When we get into this section of Hebrews, theologically, we are in deep waters. So I hope that you will work hard to try to follow uh, the, 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 the teaching of Scripture at this point. I'll do my best to make it clear and understandable. But the point is, we must grasp these truths in order to really know and understand what Christ's priesthood means for us today. So notice, first of all, as we look in these verses, we're looking at verses 1 through 10. Uh, I'm going to read the text. Uh, I'm going to ask that you just uh, listen and follow along as I read uh, as we begin entering into this portion of Hebrews. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called of God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, Yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray as we begin. Father, tonight we need your help. We pray that your spirit would give illumination, uh, that you would uh, help me as I try to communicate these truths that you would help me to speak uh, clearly and truthfully, um, that you would guard me from uh, misspeaking uh, and from creating confusion. We pray that you would make plain your truth, that you would help us to know and understand what it means that Christ is our high priest. We ask that you would bless this time together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So, We need to look. There are two truths that you need to grasp that will help you to know and understand what Christ's high priesthood is and what it means. And the first truth is found in the first four verses here. I want you to notice that the topic of these first four verses is the Old Testament priesthood. Notice in verse 1 it says, For every high priest taken from among men. Every high priest. Notice that the topic that is in discussion in these verses is not just priesthood in general. This is a discussion of the high priesthood. And in particular, it's a discussion of the Old Testament high priesthood of Aaron and the Levitical priests that descended directly from Aaron. So we can call this the, uh, the order of Aaron, the high priesthood according to the order of Aaron. And so in these verses, first of all, you need to notice that it is the office of high priest which is in view. And secondly, notice that it is the Aaronic order of high priest which is being discussed. Verse 4, it says, just as Aaron was. So this Old Testament order of high priest began with Aaron at Mount Sinai. And according to God's explicit command, you remember when Aaron grew old, God commanded him to go up onto Mount Hor with Moses and his son Eliezer. And as uh, uh, Moses took the, uh, the priestly clothing off of Aaron and placed it on his son Eliezer, and Eliezer was inducted into that office in place of his father. So there was this 
a perpetual or perpetuated priesthood that descended from father to son, beginning with Aaron. And this office was uh, uh, continued down through uh, the time of the tabernacle, uh, during the time of the judges, and afterward, when Solomon built his temple, the high priest continued to function in the temple in Jerusalem. So verses 1 through 4 describe this Old Testament office of high priest as it was uh, uh, revealed in the Old Testament covenant law. Now, the point is that in, dis- in discussing this uh, er- Aaronic priesthood, we need also to recognize that the whole point of discussing this Old Testament priesthood is in order for us to draw a comparison or a contrast with the priesthood of Christ. Look back into chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Uh, remember back in chapter 1, at the end of chapter 1, he talked about Christ being our high priest. So here, as we begin in chapter 5, we're beginning a, uh, a, a clear uh, ex- explanation and discussion of how the Old Testament priesthood relates to this high priesthood of Christ. And so the first truth that you need to grasp, this foundational truth about the superiority of Christ's high priesthood is that this better high priesthood of Christ is prefigured by the Aaronic priesthood. In other words, the Aaronic priesthood provided a picture and an example against which we can compare the priesthood of Christ. So notice, first of all, here as we talk about Christ's better priesthood, that it is... Uh, uh, that is prefigured in the Old Testament Aaronic priesthood, or we could call it the Levitical priesthood. Notice, first of all, that uh, this uh, Old Testament priesthood defined the role of priests. So in verse 1, he says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. So notice in verses 1 and 2, and we're going to move on into verse 2 in a moment, but we see here that it is this Old Testament priesthood that defined the role of the high priest. Notice that there are three prepositional phrases in the beginning of verse 1. These three prepositional phrases describe three different aspects of the function of the high priesthood. Notice the first phrase is that he is taken from, there's your preposition, he's taken from among men. So here we see the first fact about how the the Old Testament high priesthood functioned. And we see here the priest's identification with his people. In other words, we see that this high priest was chosen from among the body of the children of Israel, from the entire group of the children of Israel. And he was chosen out uh, because he is also a man, an Israelite, similar to them. They share a common humanity. They share a common descent through Abraham and through Isaac and Jacob. And so, first of all, we see that the, pro- the, the, the priest identified himself with the people whom he served. Um, we can see from this statement that God did not choose an angel to serve as a priest. Why? Because the, pro- the priest needed to be a man just like those whom he came to serve. And so uh, this priest identified himself. Uh, he was uh, identified in union with those whom he served through their common humanity. And that includes their sins and their weaknesses. And so we see, first of all, the the priest's identification. Notice the second fact. It says that he is appointed for men. There's your second preposition, the word for, that he is appointed for men. And this indicates his representation. Uh, uh, The role of the priest is to represent and act on the behalf of those to whom he ministers. He represents men in the presence of God. So here we see his representation that he is appointed for men. In other words, he is to represent men in God's presence. And then we see a third statement about this, that it is in things pertaining to God. The word in is your preposition there. 
And so this indicates his mediation. Uh, the things that pertain to God are stated in the end of the verse there that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So these things that pertain to God are the offering of acceptable sacrifices for the atonement of sins. And the high priest stands in a position between God and man and represents the interests of both. So we see here his mediation. So here in verse 1, uh, we see, first of all, in the first half of verse 1, we see his identification, his representation, and his mediation. And these are all aspects of the function of the priesthood. But then notice at the end of verse 2 here, we see also the purpose of priests. It says that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And we can, we can uh, uh, continue to use some parallel terms here. This is the priest's presentation. He presents offerings to God. So this is the purpose of priesthood. The purpose of the priesthood is to offer something to God. Now, the word that's used here, the word for offer, is the normal term, the technical term that is always used for a priestly action of offering a sacrificial offering to God on the altar. So under the Old Testament law, we see there were two kinds of offerings that he made. He said that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Now, just to go back to the Old Testament and understand what's the difference between these two things. Well, just to generally uh, uh, understand the difference, the gifts would be those sacrifices that did not require shedding of blood. They would be things like the drink offering. They had a flagon of wine that they would pour out at the base of the altar as part of their uh, sacrificial ceremony. So there were drink offerings. There were also meal offerings. And these meal offerings were made of grain. Uh, they were baked into cakes. Uh, sometimes it was uh, simply fresh, uh, freshly harvested grain. Uh, and these were, a portion of these were offered directly on the, offer, uh, on the altar to God. And so the gifts would represent those sacrifices to God that were bloodless sacrifices. But on the other hand, you have those that are sacrifices for sins. And these sacrifices for sins are those that required the death of an animal and the sacrifice of an animal and the shedding of his blood. Now, there were many, many different kinds in the book of Leviticus. Uh, there were burnt offerings and peace offerings and uh, I can't think of some of the others. There were, there were uh, 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 several of these different types of animal sacrifices that were made uh, that, uh, that represented the offerings that were made by the priests in behalf of the people. So we see here that the main purpose for priesthood is to offer acceptable sacrifices to God in order to atone for human sins. So here we see the purpose or the presentation of priests. Now, the point we need to keep in mind with this is that the priesthood exists because sin exists. The only reason a priest is necessary because, is because of man's sinfulness. It is man's sinfulness that lies at the root of priesthood. Man has broken God's law. He has violated his relationship with God. He has incurred guilt and he has become liable to God's punishment. And for these reasons, priesthood exists to provide a propitiatory sacrifice to God that will allow God to be merciful to the sinner. So we see in verse 1 here, we see the function of priests, their uh, identification, their representation and their mediation uh, the purpose of priests, and that's his presentation. And then notice in verse 3, we see here the disposition of priests. It says, uh, and excuse me, in verse 2 rather, he says, He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. So when it says here, he can have compassion, we see here not only the the function and purpose of priests, but also their sympathy. That priests have sympathy with those to whom they minister. And we can notice here that the word compassion in the original language 
it's a very expressive term. I'm just going to go ahead and say it in Greek here. Uh, metria pathe. And that word pathe, you may recognize that, comes from the Greek word, which means to feel. We have the word pathos or pathetic. And all of these terms come from uh, the word uh, pathe or sympathy. Sympathy is, also comes from this word pathe. So the word metria pathe uh, is composed of two words. The first word has to do with the idea of a measured amount or with the idea of moderation. And so here we see that the priest is supposed to be uh, have a moderation of his feelings in dealing with sinful people. And the idea of that is this idea of moderation of his feelings is that he is neither too lenient in his attitude towards those who sin, neither is he too severe towards those who sin. And if he's too lenient, then people will not take sin seriously when, to God, sin is a serious matter. On the other hand, if he is so severe with those who are sinful, they have no hope of being able to be reconciled or uh, being able to uh, be at- have their sins atoned for before God. So the idea here is that the, the, the priest has sympathy or compassion And this is his disposition towards those whom he serves. And so we need to notice first the object of his sympathy. It says those who are ignorant and going astray. Those whom he exercises this compassionate restraint towards are described here as those who are ignorant and going astray. Uh, Going astray, the word here has to do with uh, wandering away or Uh, uh, um, um, becoming lost, wandering astray. And so these two terms are, uh, are put together to form the idea that there are certain sins that people commit uh, either in ignorantly or inadvertently, or uh, the idea is that sometimes they sin uh, 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 without uh, ever intentionally intending to jump out and, and commit a sin against God. And in fact, in the Old Testament, we can see that God himself distinguished between two types of sin. There were sins that were called presumptuous sins. Those were sins that were committed against God's law and God's person with a high hand. And they were intentionally committed. But on the other hand, there are what are called unintentional sins. Uh, Let's turn and just look at an example of this in the Old Testament. Turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 15. Numbers, chapter 15, verses 27 through 31. I'm going to ask that you go ahead and read this aloud with me. Numbers 15, uh, 27 through 31. All right, let's read this together. And if a person sins unintentionally, Then he shall bring a female goat in its first year as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for the person who sins unintentionally when he sins unintentionally before the Lord to make atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. You shall have one law for him who sins unintentionally, for him who is native born among the children of Israel, and for the stranger who dwells among them. But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native born or a stranger, That one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord. He has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. And so we see here that the priest has sympathy towards those that commit these, what the Bible calls, unintentional sins. Now, if we're honest with ourselves... All of us understand the truth that all of our sins are intentional. No one just accidentally sins. We sin because we choose to sin. But the point that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Old Testament law is, is pointing out a distinction in the fact that oftentimes our sins are not those that we commit in rebellion or rejection of God and his authority and his law over us, they are sins that we commit uh, in passion, or we commit them inadvertently, or we commit them uh, uh, simply because we're not careful. 
And the point is that the priest here is to exercise this moderation and restraint in his disposition towards those who sin unintentionally. So this is the object of his uh, of his sympathy, but notice also the reason for his sympathy. And it says here, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Now, the, the word weakness here means the weakness of sinful human flesh. The idea is that uh, uh, he has a sin nature just like the people whom he serves. Now, when it says that he's subject to weakness, the original term is really much more expressive. It's the term it says that he's laid about with weakness or he is surrounded. He is uh, pressed on all sides by this weakness of sin, sinful human flesh. And so because the priest has a sinful nature that confronts him at every turn, he can feel sympathy and compassion toward those who commit sins. Now, this sympathy and compassion also motivated him so that when he performed his priestly duties on the behalf of these sinful people, his personal interest was engaged in offering these sacrifices on their behalf. And we need to understand here that the point is sympathy was an essential and and critical requirement for a high priest of God. In order for him to effectively execute his office, it was necessary for him to have sympathy for those who sinned. So we see, first of all, that the, uh, uh, the Aaronic priesthood defined the role of priests. And we see here, as we've already described, we see his identification, his representation, his mediation, his presentation, and finally his disposition. Then when we get to verse 3, Here we see another aspect of the Aaronic priesthood. And here we see that the the order of Aaronic priests of the Old Testament also demonstrated the obligation of priests. The obligation of priests. Notice in verse 3, he says, Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. Notice it says that this is a requirement. This is an obligation that the priest must fulfill. And it says that just as he has to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people, likewise he also has to offer sacrifices for his own sins first. And we can illustrate this by thinking about the most important uh Uh, part of the high priest ministry in the uh, Old Testament calendar year. And that was the Day of Atonement. The seventh month on the Jewish calendar, the tenth day of the seventh month, was the Day of Atonement. And this was the day when the high priest would take a bull and he would offer that bull on the altar as a sacrifice. And uh, he would take the blood of that bull and he would go into the tabernacle and into the most holy place of the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant was. And he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And he would do this in order to make atonement for sins. But uh, we're not going to turn there, but if you want to write this reference down, Leviticus 16, 6, then verses 11 through 14, and then verse 15, we can see very clearly here, the scriptures state very plainly that before the priest could present the blood in the Holy of Holies, he had to first make an offering for himself. That he had to take the blood of the offering for himself and go into the tabernacle and sprinkle the mercy seat and then come out and he would offer another sacrifice for the people and he would take that blood and again he would enter into the holy place and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. But the point is he had to offer for himself first. That was his obligation. This was not an optional action. Now, we might think, well, you know, the the high priesthood, this is a person who was appointed to his priestly position by God himself. Uh, It was a glorious and an honorable office. But even the high priest was still a sinful human being 
and he needed to offer sacrifice for his own sins before he could offer sacrifice for the sins of others. So here we see his obligation, and this is a further aspect of this Aaronic priesthood. And then we get down to verse 4, and we see a final fact that we need to understand. The Aaronic priesthood described the appointment of priests. So verse 3 says, uh, excuse me, verse 4 says, And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. And we can describe this as his position, the position of the priest. Because priesthood is a divine institution established by God, no one can intrude into the priest's office without divine authorization, without being chosen and called specifically by God. No one can take this office on his own authority. Think with me for a moment about the the high priesthood in the time of Christ. What was the high priesthood like in the days when Christ was on earth? Well, in the days of Christ, the, the high priesthood was a corrupt office. In fact, there are two high priests that are mentioned in the book of John uh, that both functioned at different times in the life of Christ. Uh, the first is Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest who, uh, uh, who did the examination and trial of Christ uh, before delivering him to Pilate for crucifixion. And so it was this Caiaphas who... Uh, condemned Jesus, an innocent man, condemned him to, uh, to the death of the cross. But then we're also told that his father-in-law, a man by the name of Annas, was the previous high priest. Now, as we've mentioned, the normal pattern was for the high priest to remain in office until he died, and then his son would fill his slot. But in the time of Christ, we see that the high priest's office was bought and sold. It's kind of like... Uh, the priestly offices in the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. Uh, there was the problem where people who were rich, they would buy up uh, uh, bishop seats or uh, different offices in the church. And in the time of Christ, the Roman government would auction off the high priesthood to the highest bidder. Uh, and uh, because Annas did something that Romans didn't like, they deposed him. And they to- chose another person. They chose Caiaphas to take his place. And so... Uh, this was the way the office was functioning in the time of Christ, but that's not how God intended for it to function. God intended that the high priest was one who was called by God. Now, that calling of God was not individual in in the sense of Aaron's sons, other than Eliezer that was at the direct command of God for this transfer to occur, Uh, We understand that this office was a hereditary office, that their authority was derived by their descent from Aaron. So here we see that the priest who was called and appointed by God was the one who God uh, received and accepted into that office. Now, in Old Testament history, there were several occasions when people attempted to intrude into the high priest office, and they got themselves into big trouble. We can think about Saul. Remember Saul before the battle, and he was pressed, and uh, Samuel had not yet come, and therefore uh, he forced himself and offered the sacrifice instead of waiting for Samuel's arrival. And God told him, your kingdom is taken away from you. He lost his kingdom because he tried to intrude into the king's into the priest's office. We can think about King Isaiah, uh, who entered the temple to burn incense on the altar of incense. And we're told that God struck him with leprosy because of his pride and arrogance. So we see here that this uh, uh, calling, this uh, appointment by God was an essential characteristic of a legitimate priesthood and of the Aaronic priesthood in particular. And so we're saying here that uh, no one takes this honor to himself, but he who is called of God, just as Aaron was. So Aaron was called of God to be the high priest. His son followed him in that office, 
What I want for us to notice is that in these verses, Aaron is presented and the, the, the priesthood of Aaron is presented in a very positive fashion. In other words, the author of Hebrews is not here tearing down these Old Testament institutions in order to raise up Christ. Because his point is that Aaron was a faithful priest. Now, we know he was not a perfect priest. Uh, All we have to do is think about uh, the golden calf incident when Aaron allowed the children of Israel to worship the golden calf. You remember uh, when Moses rebuked him Aaron said, well, you know, they gave me this gold and I threw it in the fire and this calf came out. And so Aaron was complicit in their sin. Aaron was not a perfect man. But as he is presented in the Old Testament and as the author of Hebrews presents his priesthood, we see that this is a positive picture of priestly ministry. And the whole point of this picture, this positive picture of priestly ministry, is that it was a preparation for the arrival of a better priest that is of Christ. So the Aaronic priesthood prepared for Christ's superior priesthood by picturing the essential elements of priestly ministry. So we saw the identification of priests, the representation of priests, the mediation of priests, the presentation of priests, the disposition of priests, the obligation of priests, and the position of priests. So we see not only is Christ's better priesthood prefigured by the Aaronic priesthood, but as we move into verses 5 through 7, we're going to see this basic fundamental fact that we need to grasp. And that is Christ's better high priesthood is proclaimed according to the order of Melchizedek. So it says here in verse 5, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest just as Aaron was chosen and appointed by God so was Christ the office of high priest was an honorable and glorious position Uh, think about the beautiful priestly garments that God commanded Moses to make for the high priest's office let me just read this verse Exodus 28 and verse 2 God told Moses and you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother notice for glory and for beauty the whole point of that, that uh, the garments, those priestly garments, were to, uh, to highlight and demonstrate the honor and glory of that office of the high priest. And so here we see that Christ did not glorify himself. He did not uh, uh, take this glorious and honorable office on his own authority. Instead, he is, uh, uh, the author is showing that Uh, By presenting Aaron, first of all, as a positive example, he's going to show how Christ, like Aaron, is a faithful priest, but he is greater than Aaron. Now, this is a style of argumentation that we've already seen in the book of Hebrews. You remember in chapter 3, when he begins by introducing that Christ is greater than Moses. He begins by saying what? He says uh, that uh, Moses was faithful. Christ is was faithful just as Moses was faithful. Moses is presented positively. There's a positive comparison there, but then he, he goes on to prove that Christ is greater than Moses. And it's the same pattern we're seeing here. He's showing that Aaron was a faithful and honorable high priest, but that Christ is a more glorious, a better high priest than Aaron. So Christ's superiority is shown in two different ways in verses 5 through 10. And this is what we're going to be spending the the rest of our time here. But notice that uh, in verse 5, the emphasis is on Christ's appointment to the high priest's office. Um, uh, Christ's calling and appointment is the first aspect of Christ's priesthood that is addressed here. Now, I want you to just uh, notice this sequence. In verses 1 through 4, we see under the Aaronic priesthood, it showed there were two essential characteristics of the Aaronic priesthood that we need to keep in mind. The first was his sympathy for those to whom he ministered. 
And secondly, was his appointment by God. Now, in showing that Christ is superior to Aaron in verses 5 through 10, he's going to talk about these two things in reverse order. So first of all, in verses uh, uh, 5 and 6, we're going to see that he, uh, uh, he addresses the, uh, the appointment of Christ is superior to Aaron's appointment to office. And then in verses 7 through 10, we're going to see that Christ's qualifications for office are superior to Aaron's qualifications. And those qualifications have to do with his sympathy for those who are in weakness. So notice, first of all, the superiority of Christ's appointment. And this we see in verses 5 and 6. And there are two Old Testament quotations that the author uses to prove unequivocally the superiority of Christ's appointment to the high priest's office. First of, uh, reference in verse 5 here, he quotes from Psalm 2, 7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is the second time the author has quoted this verse in Hebrews. The first time was in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5. And there he was showing that, the, uh, that uh, Christ, the son, is superior to angels in his divine being because he is the son. And so here we see that the, the emphasis in this reference is on the person of Christ as the son. So the two main titles of Christ in the book of Hebrews are high priest and the son. And he's bringing those two titles together in these verses. So first of all, he's pointing out that, uh, that Christ's appointment to office is superior because the person who is appointed is superior. Christ himself in his person is more honorable and glorious than Aaron was in his person. Now, when he brings in this quotation, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, the, uh, the, the point of this statement is not that there was a time in history when Christ became a son of God. That's not what this is saying. This is an Old Testament style of speaking in which God was, uh, was speaking about the, uh, the Davidic heirs to the throne of, uh, of, of the kingdom and promising that he would adopt them as his royal son to rule in the kingdom of God. Uh, when God promised David that his sons would rule, he, uh, he promised that uh, his son, he would accept his son as the son of God. Now, that was symbolic in that case, but it was also uh, prophetic because it was reference to a future son of David who was Jesus Christ himself who would fulfill that office of king. And so the point here is not that Christ was born of God at some point in time. This is the point in time in which God uh, announces and uh, uh, proclaims Christ as the Davidic king to rule on the throne of David. And so the today here is the day of Christ's resurrection. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says this, that Jesus Christ was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It was the resurrection of Christ that was God's public demonstration, God's public declaration that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the promised king, and that God is installing him as king on the throne of David. So the point here is that Jesus as the Son of God from eternity and the Messiah of God who will rule over God's kingdom is far superior in his person to Aaron, and therefore Christ's appointment to high priesthood is greater because his person is greater. The one who is appointed is greater. And then notice the second quotation in verse 6. He also says in another place, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this is from Psalm 110, verse 4. Now, the interesting thing is that Psalm 110 is also a messianic psalm. In the first three verses of Psalm 110, uh, uh, God is promising that he would uh, 
uh, he would establish his Messiah as king and that he would sit at God's right hand until God places his enemies under his feet. And so that is also a clear indication of Christ's kingly authority and role. And that's in the first three verses of Psalm 110. And then the fourth verse is this that we see here. And he proclaims this messianic king to be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So in this context, the statement quoted here declares God's appointment of King Messiah to be a, to be a priest. And the fact that we need to, to take note of here is that Christ combines the office of of king and priest in one person. And furthermore, this statement explicitly declares that God has appointed Christ, Messiah, to be a high priest. So the combination of these two texts, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, also shows us that the time in which Christ was appointed to royal authority and the time that he was appointed to the office of high priest was one and the same. This occurred at the time of his resurrection, his ascension to God's right hand, his enthronement as he waits for God to place his enemies under his feet. And so we see that Jesus Christ is a priest who is also a king. And so he goes on to say, you're a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The Old Testament priesthood was according to the order of Aaron. And this word order, the the idea in this word order is a succession, an official succession of office from father to son. And so the descendants of Aaron received the office of high priest by succession. But Melchizedek had no recorded succession. And so the point here is not that Christ is somehow descended from Melchizedek and therefore he's qualified for office. In fact, we see that Melchizedek here, the idea of the order of Melchizedek, this word order is indicating a a picture or a type or an example that was given through Melchizedek of what Christ's high priesthood would be like. And so we see that this priesthood after the order of Melchizedek means that it's Melchizedek's priesthood that provides the pattern or the example of Christ's priesthood. Now, the man Melchizedek is a rather mysterious person. In fact, he only appears twice in the entire Old Testament. The first time we see uh, Melchizedek is when he is a king and a priest who blesses Abraham in the book of Genesis. And then nearly a thousand years later in Uh, In the book of Psalms, David records this statement that God is called uh, Christ to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So what is the significance of the order of Melchizedek? Well, the author doesn't explain this until we get to chapter 7. But for now, it's sufficient for us to draw the conclusion here that Melchizedek, the office of Uh, The the priesthood of Melchizedek is an example of Christ's priesthood because Melchizedek was at the same time a king and a priest. And Christ's priesthood is a priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek because he fills the dual role of the messianic king and God's high priest. And therefore we see that Christ's appointment to office is greater than Aaron's appointment, not only because the person who is appointed is greater, but because the office to which he is appointed is greater. It is a dual office in which he is both king and priest. So we see, first of all, that Christ's priesthood is superior because of the superiority of his appointment. Then we get to verse 7. We begin the second uh, uh, aspect of understanding how Christ's priesthood is superior to Aaron's. And here we see the superiority of his qualifications. Notice in verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications 
with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Now, when it talks about the days of his flesh, it's talking about the the period of his earthly life and ministry, the time of Christ's incarnation. Uh, uh, And these verses show that the two primary uh, qualifications for priestly office are sympathy for those who he serves and appointment to office by God. And so now he's going to begin to discuss and show how Christ's uh, sympathy as high priest is superior to the sympathy that was given by the Aaronic priests under the Old Testament priesthood. And that's because Christ's qualifications for ministry are superior to Aaron's. And we need to remember that Christ is superior to Aaron because Aaron was a sinful human being and Christ was a sinless human being. So we need to understand that Christ's sympathy for human sin does not spring from his own personal experience of sin, but it springs from his experience of temptation. As we saw in chapter 4 in verse 15, Uh, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Christ suffered as a man. He experienced temptation. And this qualified him to serve as high priest in a way that is far superior to Aaron's priesthood. And so we need to recognize that in these verses, and we'll see this as we work through them, that the superiority of Christ's qualification for high priesthood relate directly to the function of suffering in his life and to the nature of the sufferings that he experienced. So notice in verse 7 that his sufferings equipped him with greater sympathy for our suffering. When it says that uh, this occurred in the days of his flesh, this is generally a reference to the period of his entire earthly incarnation and ministry. But in the description we see in verse 7, it's clear that there's a more specific reference to a particular event in Christ's life. And this event is uh, before Christ's crucifixion, the night before his crucifixion, his prayer offered to God in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see this recorded in Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 46. And uh, the interesting thing about that, uh, uh, the Luke record of Gethsemane, is that it emphasizes the suffering that Christ was experiencing as he cried out to his heavenly Father in prayer. So before his crucifixion, Christ prayed with great agony as he wrestled with the will of God concerning the necessity of his approaching sacrificial death. And we're told that uh, his prayer was su- was such agony that uh, 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 blood, like a sweat like b- drops of blood was dropping from his body. But the point it's making in this verse is that he was heard Because of his godly fear. So when it says that he was heard by God. It means that God heard his prayer. And God answered his prayer. So we need to ask the question. What was it that Christ prayed for. And that God heard his prayer. And answered his prayer. Well first of all. It's clear. That. Uh. Christ's prayer says he prayed to him who was able to save him from death. Christ's prayer was not a prayer that sprang from fear of death. In other words, Christ was not fearful or uh, worried about facing death itself. Death was not the thing that gave Christ such agony of spirit as he was praying to his heavenly father. No, instead we see that as, as Christ prayed in the garden... Uh, uh, Christ prayed in absolute submission to the will of God. He said three times, not what I will, but your will be done. 
Christ submitted himself to the will of his heavenly father that he would offer himself as a sacrifice for human sin. And so it was not a fear of death that was driving the agony and suffering that Christ was experiencing. Rather, his agony sprang from the necessity of taking the sins of the world upon himself. And then the resulting separation from his father that would come as he bore our sins on the cross. Remember what he cried out on the cross. uh, uh, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So when Christ prayed and submitted himself fully to do the father's will. He offered himself to God as a sacrifice for sin. And so therefore, when he prayed to God who was able to save him from death, his prayer was not to avoid the death of the cross. He was submitting himself to do the will of God, but he was praying in faith that God would afterward raise him from the dead. And so when it talks here that he was praying to him who was able to save him from death, Notice those two words, from death. This prayer was not that God would save him from entering death, but that God would save him out of death through resurrection. And it says here, because of his reverence, his godly fear, that God heard him and answered his prayer. And if you want to see the the sequence of Christ's crying out to God in suffering and anguish for human sin that uh, ultimately culminated in his death and followed by his trusting submission to God in the midst of his sufferings and his confident assurance of resurrection after death. Read Psalm 22 because all of that is in there. That's called the Psalm of the Cross. And we can see that verses 1 through 8. We see his deep sufferings ending in death. Verses 9 through 18, his trusting submission in the midst of sufferings. And then in verses 19 through 31, his confident assurance of resurrection and accomplishing the work of redemption. So it says here, although he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, this statement has caused a lot of people a problem. How could Christ learn? How could Christ grow? How could Christ change? Hebrews 13, the same book. You know what this, uh, Hebrews 13, 6. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. How could a perfect Savior learn something? Well, this is part of the mystery of the Incarnation. God, Christ in his humanity, uh, he was able to grow. He was able to develop in his humanity. Let me just read some verses again from the book of Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, it says, speaking of uh, Christ as a child, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and Men. So here we see that in his humanity, Christ grew and developed, that there was a development in his life that is a normal part of the human experience. And so part of Christ's preparation and equipment for the office of high priest was that he had to learn through sufferings. Now, when it says that he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. We need to be clear. It's not that he had to learn to obey. Jesus said in uh, John, uh, if I can find the passage here. Uh, John, where did I write that down? I don't. I didn't record it. <clears throat> Jesus himself speaking to the Pharisees said, I always do his will. Jesus didn't have to learn to obey the Father. What he had to learn was the cost of, of obedience in suffering. That obedience requires suffering. And so we see that Jesus 
in his suffering, through experiencing suffering, it qualified him to be a merciful high priest who sympathizes with the weaknesses and temptations and sufferings of his people. And so we see that it was his sufferings which uh, uh, equipped him to sympathize with those whom he came to serve. But then we notice also in verses 9 and 10, we see a second way that his sufferings equipped him. His sufferings equipped him to fulfill a better office. So verse 9 says, And having been perfected. So these verses now move from the significance of his sufferings to the result of his sufferings. And it says here that his sufferings were perfective. Again, this is simply uh, 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 the same concept that Christ's sufferings worked to bring completion to his qualifications. So the idea here of perfection is not the idea of moral perfection. Uh, Jesus didn't become more morally perfect. This is talking about his qualifications for office, that through his sufferings, his qualifications were completed. He became completely and perfectly qualified for his offerings by suffering. It says that having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Here we see here that the result of his sufferings were to become the, the, this says the author, the original word there is literally, it's the cause or the reason of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And the point here is that in suffering for human sin and offering himself on the cross as a sacrifice for human sin, Christ was performing a priestly action. It was the action of presenting a sacrifice to God. And therefore, the offering that Christ was offering was himself. The result of Christ's offering brought an eternal salvation to those who obey him. Notice the parallel here. Christ learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and we are to obey him. What does that mean? Well, in the context here, it's talking about the obedience of faith. Uh, Paul talks about the obedience of faith. The idea here is that our obedience is not simply keeping his commandments, but our obedience to Christ is our faith in Christ for salvation and that we are obeying his, uh, his revelation brought to us from the Father by believing in him and accepting his sacrifice on our behalf. And so we see here that Christ's sufferings function as an important part of his priestly work. And this shows another facet of Christ's high priestly ministry that is far superior to Aaron's. Aaron's ministry only covered sins temporarily. Uh, The Day of Atonement came around every year. Every year he had to offer those sacrifices because they only covered sins temporarily. But Christ's sacrifice of himself accomplished an eternal salvation. And he concludes by repeating the quotation from verse 6, called by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now I want you to notice that this statement basically functions as brackets around verses 7 through 9. And verses 7 through 9 is a discussion of Christ's sufferings. When he brings back in this statement that Christ's priesthood is after the example and pattern of Melchizedek, he is linking Christ's Melchizedek and priesthood with the significance of Christ's sufferings. And thus, this Melchizedek and priesthood is superior to Aaron's office of priesthood. So we need to stop and think about what this means for us. Let's just summarize what we've seen in this passage. First of all, the Old Testament priesthood after the order of Aaron provides 
a typological picture which foreshadows the coming of Messiah to be a superior high priest. The superiority of Christ's priesthood is cryptically declared by his appointment after the order of Melchizedek. But this superiority is made explicit in two ways. First of all, Christ is greater than Aaron because in his appointment to office, Christ is more glorious in his person as the son and he is appointed to a more honorable office as both king and priest. But secondly, Christ is greater than Aaron because he is more highly qualified to be our, to be our high priest by his sufferings. These sufferings equip him to be a sympathetic high priest And his suffering and death provide a far better priestly sacrifice for our sin. So what does it mean for us tonight? Well, if we look at verse 11 and 12 and following, we see that when the author wrote these words to his original audience, they had a problem. They were immature. They were allowing the the struggles and the temptations and the persecutions that they were facing to to create distance between them and God. They were drifting from uh, from their spiritual moorings. They were departing from holding fast to their faith in Christ. And so the reason that the author mentions is because they were immature. And therefore... We need to be diligent to learn and understand the truth about Christ's high priesthood and go on to spiritual maturity. What is spiritual maturity? It's the, it's the, it's the ability to access God's resources in Christ by faith. And the result is that we can then resist temptation and persecution. We can enjoy spiritual rest even in the midst of difficult circumstances. So the point is, we need to apply ourselves to knowing and understanding how Christ's high priesthood relates to me personally. That's a part of our growth to maturity. Here's one more thing that you can think about. It's because Christ is greater than anything that this world can offer that you need to hold fast to your confession of Christ. There's nothing in this world that we can go back to that can provide for us what God has provided for us in Christ. We need to hold fast to our faith in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you've given us such a great high priest who's glorious and honorable in his person, who's your king and your priest, who has experienced the sufferings that qualify him to be our high priest, to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, to to provide for us an eternal salvation through his suffering and death. And so we ask that you would help us to be diligent, not to be spiritually lazy, but to apply ourselves to understanding your truth, to growing in our relationship with you through Christ, increasing in our knowledge of Christ and of God, and that through that we would become mature, that we would be capable of standing firm in the midst of the tests and trials of life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.